When spring break started a little over a month ago, the world all seemed perfectly, wonderfully normal. But by the end of the week, schools were canceled, and San Antonio was shutting down and sheltering in place. It's hard to believe we've been doing this social distancing thing for over a month now. For better or worse, it's become the new normal. We all have stories of what these last few weeks have been like. If I were a real journalist, I'd assemble these tales and use them to paint a comprehensive picture of what the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic has been on the people of San Antonio. But as we established last season, I'm not a real journalist. I'm just a guy with a microphone. And besides, I'd be in direct violation of the mayor's stay-home, work-safe declaration if I were to interview anyone other than the three people I'm living with inside of my home. And so, that's exactly what I'm going to do. The story of how the Hightower family is navigating these strange times isn't unique, and it certainly isn't heroic, but it is the story we're going to tell in this chapter of the San Antonio Storybook a podcast about the people and the places of the Alamo City. I'm Brantley Hightower. Before the world turned upside down, my wife and I would start each morning by walking our girls to school. Even though they're technically not going to school anymore, we still start the day by getting dressed and going for a walk. All right, let's walk. We're walking, we're walking, we're walking. Some days, this requires considerable motivation. So, did you sleep well, Darcy? Great. Yep. But I have to go up the little in. That's our youngest daughter, Darcy. When she says she slept in, it means she woke up at 5.30. Regardless of when she goes to sleep at night, Darcy always wakes up super early and is always super excited to face the day. She's in first grade and is about to turn seven. More on that in a bit. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm hearing you spitball some ideas here, Sammy. So I'm interested where you're going to go yes, with this. Yes, I think you should put Hello. fire on it. And you, should, uh-huh. and you could make it look like a sports car. I mean, could I put like a mouth of like a dragon on it? Yes, too? that would be awesome. All right. So the, the person dragon. giving me tips on how to improve the appearance of my 2010 Toyota Prius is Sammy. She's in the fourth grade and is 10 years old. As with many older siblings, she's very interested in fairness and in following the rules. Except for the rule her father has about walking in the middle of the street. Sammy, let's get out of the middle of the street, please. Thank you. Sammy's killjoy father is, of course, me. When I'm not secretly recording my family's daily activities, I'm an architect. I have a small office and I teach at San Antonio College. I feel, I think part of what's making me cranky about that project is I I like the project, I think it's really fun, but I haven't been able to draw on it at all. Yeah. The intoxicatingly chipper morning person you just heard is Clara. We've been married for a little over 14 years now. She's an architect as well and works at a large design firm with offices all over the world. Now, one of the good things about being an architect right now is that working from home is pretty straightforward. All you need is a computer and space to lay out a set of drawings. Of course, the bad thing about being an architect right now is that you also need clients who are willing to invest large sums of money to design and build a building. As the economy continues to grind to a halt, we've both seen a number of our projects go on hold. That's not good, especially for a small business like mine. On the other hand, given my reduced workload, I now have the time to lead our family's homeschooling efforts. Are you excited, Darcy? Uh Uh-huh. What's exciting you the most about homeschool? Because I get to spend time with my family instead of going to school and I don't get to see you guys. That's a good answer. What about you, Sammy? Same. Are we going to stick to the schedule? Mm Mm-hmm. All right. Get to your reading. Darcy, let's get on your workbook. To be perfectly honest, that first week of homeschooling was a lot of fun. Sammy got really into this storytelling course we found on the Khan Academy website, and Darcy got to show off her math skills with a workbook we ordered from Amazon. We'd alternate activities in the morning until lunch, and then we'd spend an hour or so watching Neil deGrasse Tyson tell us about the cosmos. Halley's Comet is in free fall around the sun. In the afternoon, we'd go for a bike ride and work on some other creative projects. We'd also read some headlines about what was going on in the world. Okay, what, is, what does that say? 
Wall Street plummets despite Fed support. It's hard to know how much to tell the kids about everything that's going on. We obviously don't want to scare them, but it's a scary time. I want them to know that even though the COVID-19 virus seems to go easy on children, that's not the case for everyone. And so to keep everyone safe, we all have to stay at home. That's why we can't go to school or restaurants or stores. That's why so many people are out of work. Now let's go over here to a different website, because I always find it's a good idea to get your news from lots of different places. Yeah, that place is kind of boring. That was the New York Times. Okay. What's the headline there, Sammy? Texas Star Test Requirements. <gasps> yes! What does that mean? It means no star test this year! That's right. Up until this moment, Sammy had maintained a simmering level of anxiety about the state of Texas' assessment of academic readiness. She worried about these tests more than global pandemics, throwing up, or killer clowns. And so even if COVID-19 was preventing Sammy from seeing her friends, if it meant she wasn't going to have to take the STAR test, maybe it wasn't all bad. Our school district gave their teachers about a week and a half to figure out how to modify their curriculum to teach remotely. In those first few days when we were on our own, I certainly came to a much greater appreciation of all that teachers do. I was only in charge of a couple of kids for less than two weeks. I can't imagine having the patience to manage a classroom full of students for a full nine months. With the education of my children handed back to the professionals, I'm doing less teaching and more IT support. Sammy in her fourth grade class seems to be doing just fine, but as for Darcy and her first grade class... Can you see the microphone? Because there's a lot of noise on the back. Well, handling a class full of six and seven-year-olds is next to impossible under ideal conditions. And these are not ideal conditions. Darcy is in a Spanish immersion program at her school. Now that's great for her, but not so great for her dad. I'm the type of gringo who embarrasses himself when ordering quesadillas at Mexican restaurants. Needless to say, I'm completely useless when it comes to helping Darcy with her Spanish. I can't even read the instructions. I often find myself holding up my phone in front of the computer screen so I can use Google Translate to understand what the assignment is. Now, I'm perfectly aware that this scenario, this holding up of one electronic device in front of another electronic device, is completely absurd. I also realize this scenario demonstrates the privilege my family has in the current situation. We have an iPhone that we can hold up in front of an iMac. We have high-speed internet and a parent with enough spare time to troubleshoot this homeschooling thing. We also both have jobs and enough savings that we don't have to worry about how we're going to pay for groceries. At least not for now. I know a little bit about making the switch from face-to-face to remote instruction. I've been teaching a History of Architecture course at San Antonio College this semester, and so I, too, had to make that transition in a very short amount of time. The share screen, that is when you want to actually share your actual um, screen as I'm doing with you all. After a slew of required meetings and training sessions, I joined the legions of professors who suddenly had to begin using Zoom to reach their students at home. I worried that with so many universities using the same platform, the system wouldn't be able to handle all the traffic. I worried my students wouldn't have the necessary devices or data plans to access the online lectures. I worried about a lot of things, but it turns out lecturing in Zoom isn't all that different from lecturing in a classroom. I can still share images of buildings, and I can still answer questions about those images, or whatever else happens to be on the mind of my students. So is there going to be a purge? I hope not, because (laughs) uh, while uh, architects have many skills, their combat and survival skills aren't necessarily the best in a purge-type situation. So uh, Many, if not most, of my students have been laid off from their jobs that they were using to pay for school. 
and many are about to enter a labor market that is even worse than the Great Recession of a decade ago. Learning about the architecture of the Middle Ages might not be the most important thing in their lives right now, but for an hour or so on Tuesday and Thursday evenings, they can briefly forget about all that and instead talk about faraway places and the stories of how they came to be built. And to accommodate those, those three aspects of, of early Christian uh, worship, you get three elements that define these early Christian churches. Do I always sound like that when I talk? I give these lectures in the evenings in the same bedroom where my wife works during the day. Well, they've got a long, they still have a pretty good list of stuff that needs to be finished, so I just... She's on a lot of conference calls, and even though she doesn't talk about it much, I know she's under a lot of stress. Our family's health insurance is through her job, and so it's pretty important that she keep it. I know she wishes she could spend more time with the girls during the day, but we have a mortgage to pay and groceries to buy. She juggles all her many responsibilities with grace and good humor, for the most part. She even found the time to bake a cake in the shape of a princess castle. Darcy's birthday falls at the end of March. In the grand scheme of things, having to cancel a birthday party because of a global health crisis is not that big of a deal. But when you're a little girl, and when you're about to turn seven, and you haven't seen your friends for weeks, it actually is kind of a big deal. We didn't have much time to come up with a plan B for the party. Clara scavenged the pantry and was able to come up with enough ingredients for a cake, and having recently been trained in the use of the Zoom video conferencing platform, I reached out to friends, family, and teachers and had them assemble for a surprise video call. All right, so is everyone ready to sing happy birthday? It wasn't much, but it was something. We lit seven candles on the birthday cake and joined in on one of the worst renditions of the happy birthday song ever recorded. Happy I do wonder what my kids will remember about this time of their lives. In the home that we've been confined to this past month, we've tried to create a space where Sammy and Darcy don't have to worry about community spread or whether or not their parents are going to have jobs in a few months. Like everyone else in San Antonio, we've tried our best to navigate this new normal that feels anything but normal. Luckily, Sammy and Darcy are kids, and kids have a magical way of finding joy pretty much anywhere they look. They may find that joy when my wife is on a conference call or when I'm trying to record the narration track for a podcast episode, but for a parent in the middle of a pandemic, the sound of my kids' joyous laughter sounds perfectly, wonderfully normal. Thanks today to Clara, Sammy, and Darcy Hightower. I can't think of three people I'd rather be quarantined with. Christine Finnessy helped with the script, and the music was by Blue Dot Sessions. San Antonio Storybook is a production of The Rivard Report. You can find more information about this podcast and enjoy all the nonprofit journalism the report has to offer at therevardreport.com. Until next time, I'm Brantley Hightower. <laughs>